Dr. Winger, Winger Chuck has said, I mean, uh, I think that's a really important finding, this, uh, this diagnostic marker that may not just be a diagnostic marker, but it may actually be involved in, in causing the disease. And so this is, uh, this is really great work that the, that the group at Mayo has done, and we should really commend them. One other thing while I'm on that point, you know, Dr. Weinschenker is in with us here, and many of you have, have received plasma exchange. And I know for a fact that many of you have benefited from plasma exchange. And really the reason that we do that is a study led by Dr. Weinschenker. And it was a very courageous study in which he did uh, a trial where patients got either real or sham plasma exchange. And it was, it was courageous because the patients were, it was randomized. It was a randomized study. And only from that study did we really learn that, you know what, it works. So uh, I commend them for that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about transverse myelitis. I think you're getting the picture now that, that each of these probably exists on a spectrum and that there are unique features of when and where the inflammation in the nervous system occurs. Uh, and there are unique features in terms of causative agents, but they are still linked. And some things are shared, some things are unique. And so it makes sense to study them on that spectrum. And that was really the idea for this effort, bringing everybody together. From a clinical perspective, some of the symptoms are shared. And so you can help each other. Also, you can teach us as we can teach you. So the scientists over there are now arguing about some of the, the immunologic features that are specific to one versus another. And that's a good, healthy argument to have. So I'll tell you a little bit about the Johns Hopkins Project Restore. This is really an emerging effort um, that uh, we at, at Johns Hopkins have established over the last year to really define new ways of studying transverse myelitis and the cousins that are on that spectrum, new imaging studies, new ways to, divine, to uh, uh, diagnose transverse myelitis, as well as developing new immunotherapies and neuroprotective strategy. So you've heard about or you will hear about this concept of neuroprotection, rendering the nervous system resistant to the immune-mediated attack. So you can, if you've got an immune-mediated neurologic disease, you can change the immune system or you could render the nervous system resistant to the immune attack. And you've got to actually do both. So the current situation. Multiple sclerosis and transverse myelitis are disorders in which the immune system attacks and injures the nervous system. And as many or all of you know, current therapies to halt disability are only modestly effective. And as a result, most patients worsen and develop permanent disability. No treatment uh, exists currently that restores function. Why? So why is there no cure? Well. Each of these diseases is rare, with the possible exception of multiple sclerosis, but even that is somewhat rare. And so rigorously studying rare diseases is difficult because no one center has enough uh, reagents to really study it in a methodologically uh, rigorous way. And then we have a tendency to pursue our studies in an isolated manner rather than as a collaborative network which means we don't optimally share resources and information. We haven't yet identified effective biomarkers of the disease, although this is changing over time, certainly more work needs to be done. We need to understand early what a disease is, what its cousins are, and how they are responding to treatment. So biomarkers is a key word that you'll hear more and more about. We also now need to know that you can't study within a discipline. We can't just study within our, our neurology group because we learn a lot from our uh, uh, radiology colleagues and our physiology colleagues and our neuroscience colleagues. And so this concept that we, we have to work across disciplines is key. And then also we have, to some degree, failed to translate basic science findings into a clinical reality. And that's all starting to change, and it's actually quite exciting. Now, despite the fact that these are rare diseases, the economic burden of them, not even to mention the, the personal burden, the disruption of families, um, the, the, the change in, in personalities when somebody is disabled by this, but just purely from a cold economic perspective, this is a big deal and warrants study on that basis alone. 2.5 million people 
have multiple sclerosis. And if you look just at the United States alone, the societal costs exceed $5.1 billion per year. So the implications of this failure, it's not really a failure, it's just we haven't gotten there yet. But the implications are that research is not optimized, money is wasted, progress is slowed, patients lose function, patients lose hope, and patients lose lives. So, so this is what has given rise to uh, our attempt to change this. It's called the Johns Hopkins Project Restore. We need money to rapidly test ideas, collaboration to accelerate development, model systems, and when I talk about model systems, what we do very well is we work in cell culture with neurons and, and the myelin producing cells. We develop animal models of things and then clinical trials. So these are model systems that allow us to rapidly test ideas. Ultimately, clinical trials is a, a clinical trial is a prerequisite really to developing a new therapy. Without a clinical trial, we won't know for sure if it worked. So this is a comprehensive effort that will develop new diagnostic and therapeutic strategies in the treatment of neuroimmunologic disorders focusing on multiple sclerosis and transverse myelitis. It is an acronym that stands for Recover, Stop, and Regenerate, and, there, and the research projects focus on all of these areas. Recover function from acute attacks and from illness, stop the progression of disease or the progression of disability, and ultimately we need regeneration because in some people there has been such damage to the nervous system that you will need to focus on regenerative strategies including regenerating nerve cells and regenerating myelin. We think we can and will revolutionize the treatment of multiple sclerosis and NTM. We aim to cure these diseases in those who have been diagnosed to prevent them from occurring in those at risk and we hope to restore function to those disabled by them. Now, you all know that we've had a transverse myelitis center as well as an MS center at, at Johns Hopkins for some time. And one of the, the realities is that we provide clinical care for those uh, who are disabled by transverse myelitis. Hopefully we get people who are in the acute phases of transverse myelitis as well. We, we provide advanced care. We are now currently developing novel diagnostic strategies. You'll hear about some new imaging modalities that we think are very sensitive in telling you what's going on within the spinal cord and the brain. We're on the brink of new immunologic therapies. They are coming. You'll start to hear about them even this fall with a, a dramatic new treatment for multiple sclerosis called Antigrin. And restorative therapies are coming. We are learning how to reprogram the nervous system. We're not there yet. This is not imminent but it's coming. We want to be a world leader in education to test and implement novel therapeutic strategies to train scientists and clinicians. So that's what, that's what we are now launching. We're starting that uh, effectively yesterday. So I wanted to convey that to you because we're working on it. We know that there's a lot that we have not been able to do for you all as patients and we're working on it really hard. So let's talk about transverse myelitis a bit. So you've, you've heard from Dr. Pardo, the spinal cord, the anatomical organization. I don't need to go over that. That will be on the quiz, by the way, that's at the end. Um, but I don't think I need to go back over this again. So an acute myelopathy, you hear these terms and we probably just breeze right by them often without really adequately describing them. Myelopathy is something wrong with the spinal cord and that's all it is. It really is acute dysfunction of neural cells and axons within the spinal cord. So this is quite simple. You've got some process which is impairing the axons or the cables going up and down the spinal cord and affecting the nerve cells that are at that particular level of the spinal cord. And so you get four things happening. You get weak or paralyzed. You get numb. You have autonomic dysfunction, bowel and bladder dysfunction, and a lot of people, as I'm sure you will all attest, get pain. So those are really the four things that come when the spinal cord stops working. And as I've said, it really exists on a continuum of inflammatory disorders. So transverse myelitis typically, although not exclusively, is monophasic and monofocal. One phase, one attack at one region of the spinal cord. Now multiple sclerosis is kind of the opposite end of that. It is by definition multiphasic and multifocal. 
So it occurs many times in many places. Now you've just heard from Dr. Wingerchuk about neuromyelitis optica, really optic nerves and spinal cord, but sparing to a large degree the rest of the nervous system. So I've called that oligophasic. A few episodes, but maybe not as many as MS, and a few regions. Acute disseminated encephalomyelitis is all over the brain and spinal cord, but it occurs once and it doesn't come back. So the spatial limitations and the temporal features of these distinguish them. But again, we're starting to learn that although there are differences, they are linked, immunologically linked. And these are just some of the other ones. You've probably heard about Guillain-Barre or myasthenia gravis. Um, uh, so these are all kind of on that spectrum linked to varying degrees. Now when I say itis, when you hear any itis, itis means inflammation. So transverse myelopathy is a very broad term. It just means spinal cord's not working. Doesn't tell you the nature of the reason why it's not working. But if you say transverse myelitis, you're talking about inflammation. There has got to be inflammation. Well, here's a pathologic demonstration of this. So what you're seeing here is this cross-section of the spinal cord. Blue is essentially inflammation. Right? So this is a particular st uh, stain of the spinal cord tissue in which there is lots of blue cells. These are inflammatory cells. They shouldn't be there. They should stay in the blood where they belong. Or if they do come into the spinal cord, just come in a few and then leave. Not like this. So when they get in here, it means they're really angered. So they're really upset. They're causing injury. You can tell this one, this is a blood vessel here that is clotted. So it was so inflamed that, that this blood vessel actually clotted. So that is really transverse myelitis in which there's a focal inflammation within the spinal cord. Now, okay, so what? So you get inflammation. What is the neural response? In other words, what happens in the spinal cord? Well, it's one of two things. It's demyelination or it's necrosis or axonal injury. And we're starting to understand why some people go largely down this route, some people go largely down this route. This is obviously worse. This means the actual electrical cables themselves and the neurons, the, the neuron cell bodies, are destroyed. And from this there is limited recovery at present. This is a demyelinating state in which the ensheathment around the cable, the myelin, is destroyed, but the cable itself is okay. So although you turn on the light switch and the light does not go on in the acute phase, the electrical connection between the light switch and the light is still there. It's just the, the impulse is not getting through. But after the inflammation settles down, it then becomes possible either through remyelination or through some strategies that the neuron does to start firing again to recover. So then after a period of two to three weeks, you turn the light switch on and it goes on. Which, what I mean by that is you start to move again. Whereas if this occurs, it's less likely to happen. So the diagnostic criteria will have to, uh, also on the quiz will be every single one of these, the inclusion criteria, the exclusion criteria. Essentially, what I showed you was a spinal cord tissue section which defined the itis aspect of it. But there's a problem here because you kind of need your spinal cord in your body rather than under the microscope. So we, how do we define inflammation? Well, there's got to be a surrogate way to define that, and that is by the spinal tap, which many of you have had, which defines an inflammatory spinal fluid. There are white blood cells in there, or there are, there are antibodies in there. The other way to do it is by the MRI, and so many of you have gotten an MRI, and this substance is given into your vein, called gadolinium, which actually pools at areas of acute inflammation. And so if it lights up in that area in the spinal cord, that is acutely inflamed. That's really the surrogate marker of inflammation giving rise to the diagnosis of transverse myelitis. This is a paper that virtually all of us uh, uh, who are, are speaking here today put together jointly a couple years ago, and I think it's been very helpful. What also came out of this paper is a way to evaluate acute myelopathies. What do you do? And this isn't designed specifically for the patients, 
but rather for the healthcare professionals, the emergency room doctors, the family uh, care doctors, the, really the front line. Because often by the time the neurologist gets involved, it's much later. So who's on the front line? And how can we kind of assist in making the appropriate diagnosis and treatment decisions? How do you, if somebody comes into the emergency room and isn't moving their legs, and isn't, doesn't have any bowel or bladder control, and is numb, how do you start to process this information and to define, it? is it an itis, or is this a tumor, or is this a stroke of the spinal cord, and this is how we've done this. And it, it also allows you to, to come down the final pathway, say, okay, yeah, this is transverse myelitis by itself, or this is Devix disease, or it's multiple sclerosis, or various other categories as well. Also within this algorithm is a way to say, you know what, is this inflammation wholly confined within the central nervous system, or is it just part of a systemic inflammatory disease? You've heard of lupus and sarcoidosis and Sjogren's. These are systemic rheumatologic disorders. One of their manifestations is, or can be, transverse myelitis. But you've got to know that because you'll treat it differently. So I'm not going to go through this entire workup, uh, but I think it's, it's present in the handout. But I, what I will do is say that if somebody presents with an acute myelopathy, the first thing is to know, is it compressive? Meaning, is there something squishing the spinal cord? Because that's not good. And so that can be a tumor, or it can be a blood clot, or it can be a, a, a compression fracture, because that's the first thing. And we know there's a treatment for that, so you've got to rule it out right off the bat, because there's a particular high dose of steroids that would be given. That's the first thing. So is there a compressive myelopathy, meaning something is squishing the spinal cord? If so, you better act really quickly uh, and get surgical evaluation and high dose intravenous steroids. But if that's not the case, and for most of you here uh, working down this algorithm, that's not the case. This, we're, we're not talking about compressive myelopathies. So in that case, you don't have a structural cause for why the spinal cord is not working. You've got to decide, okay, it's something else. Is it inflammatory? And again, how do you define inflammatory? Is it itis? Well, you've got to get the lumbar puncture, and you've already gotten the MRI. And so if it, isn't, if it is not inflammatory, there are a series of other causes that we must think about and evaluate because their treatments may differ. If it is, we work down this pathway. There are a series of other things that we must consider. Could this be infectious? I mean, could there be an infect, a direct infection in the spinal cord? Well, maybe. And these are the things that would make you think about that. Fever, stiff neck rash, other infection, because obviously that changes it. If this is an infection, you've got to treat that first and foremost. Um, so that's one of the strategies that you need to consider. Again, we've done this, but the symptom groups are motor, sensory, autonomic, and pain. Again, motor can be weakness, just a touch of clumsiness, all the way to complete paralysis. Sensory can be a pins and needles sensation. It's virtually every day that I hear that. Um, it's a pins and needles, uh, paresthesias we call that. Sometimes it can be very uncomfortable. Other versions of that are a sunburn sensation. Lots of people will tell me it's, it feels like I'm sunburned, but I'm not. Or a squeezing band-like sensation. And all that is is that's abnormal firing of sensory nerves. Sensory nerves start out in the skin and they go into the spinal cord and relay a message up to the brain. And if there is a hot iron on your foot, that sensory nerve should fire and say, get it away. But unfortunately, people are often left with this burning sensation, but there's no hot iron anywhere around. It's because that sensory nerve is firing and it shouldn't be. So it's irritated. Now, I should tell you, I'm kind of glad in some cases that it's firing because the alternative is that it's not there at all. It died which would be complete numbness. And in most cases, there is a mixture of the two. There may be some axonal injury or the cables themselves may become injured. But in some cases, you progress from numbness to a very uncomfortable sensation, such as this sunburn sensation, and then to a more normal situation. So autonomic is typically bowel and bladder, sexual dysfunction, although most people aren't thinking about that, at least in the acute phase. 
Pain can be very debilitating and can persist for long periods of time. I know many of you have pain. And uh, I should just tell you that the strategies must be a progressive approach to taking care of it. You start with simple things. You start with topical medicines. You then go on to uh, oral medicines. You go on to combinations of medicines, even on to surgical approaches, intrathecal delivery of drugs, etc. So don't give up. It's not to say that you can always have your pain go away, but somebody needs to work with you on this progression until you get it under control. And I'm going to skip through this since we just chatted about it. The pain can be a burning type of root, well, we call it a ridiculous pain, it's this burning pain going down one side again, the tight squeezing or a banding sensation. Now we use the MRI now because it really, really helps us. As a matter of fact, we're on the brink of developing even better imaging strategies which can define is this demyelination or is this axonal injury or various forms. Right now the MRIs are very good at telling you one thing, something's not good. But it's not very good at telling you what it is that's bad. And so if you can define disease subtypes by the MRI, that will direct treatment. Because we now are starting to understand how do I fight this kind of demyelination? How do I fight this axonal injury? And the, the, the tools that you would use differ depending on what type. Now, most cancers enhance, but it, so you've heard this, transverse myelitis enhances. It typically means inflammation. I'm going to skip through this. Here is one case, um, uh, one child. Uh, and in fact, I showed this to you at the transverse myelitis meeting in Baltimore in 2001. This is one uh, transverse myelitis. It's actually over several segments in the cervical spinal cord. And this was quite severe, resulting in um, atrophy or wasting away of this child's spinal cord and, and he ended up dying and this was a 12 month old child so this is this is really the tragedy that drives us and there are now probably 15 people working uh, exclusively on this type of thing at, at Hopkins and, and this kind of reminds us why we have to keep going I will tell you that there are I've worked through the algorithm with you but there are other things that we have to think about obviously multiple sclerosis, a traumatic injury. Many of you have experienced some degree of a, of a traumatic injury, but it was often quite mild before you began, or before the transverse myelitis began. It's still something that needs to be considered and looked at. Multiple sclerosis, hopefully now, we can distinguish isolated transverse myelitis from that associated with multiple sclerosis. These are the other things that we'll need to think about, tumors, Paraneoplastic disorders are where a tumor may cause a remote effect, and that remote effect, even though the tumor is not in the spinal cord, is to cause the spinal cord not to work. Vitamin deficiency, as simple as, as that sounds, can cause an acute myelopathy. Inflammation of the blood vessels, such as that seen with lupus. It can be a spinal cord stroke, or an abnormal collection of blood vessels, or a blood clot. And I will skip these. I think they're present in the handout. These are some of the other things that we think about. Some of you, actually many of you, may have been misdiagnosed at first with Guillain-Barre. There are ways to tell these apart. As part of that paper, we've attempted to kind of provide clues as to how they can be distinguished. Guillain-Barre is an acute paralysis, just like transverse myelitis, but it's quite different. There is no transverse sensory level in Guillain-Barre. You, you typically do not have urinary retention, whereas most of you will know that in transverse myelitis, urinary retention is a big deal right off the bat. Urinary retention or urgency, whereas typically in Guillain-Barre, you, you don't get the autonomic dysfunction. In Guillain-Barre, your reflexes are typically gone. Remember when they tap on the hammer. Whereas in transverse myelitis, those reflexes are increased. And the spinal fluid looks different. Another reason for us to get the spinal fluid. In Guillain-Barre, protein is elevated, but you don't have any white blood cells. Whereas in transverse myelitis, you've got a lot of white blood cells. 
Let's see. I want to keep on track. Let me just. So I've got about uh, three minutes. Um, so I'll mention a, f a few more things, and then uh, uh, I think I'll stop. So multiple sclerosis, remember, is multiphasic, multiple phases by history or exam. The MRI can typically distinguish multiple sclerosis or even transverse myelitis, which would be the first presentation of multiple sclerosis. It just looks differently. Also, if this is going to be MS, ironically, it's much more likely to recur, but it is often much milder. There is typically sensory findings, much more so than motor. So if somebody has become completely or near completely paralyzed, that's going to be just transverse myelitis. That's not part of multiple sclerosis. So it's, a, it's always an incomplete injury in multiple sclerosis. And the spinal fluid oligoclonal bands, that just means antibodies produced in the spinal fluid. More common in multiple sclerosis, less common in transverse myelitis. And we always get a brain MRI. We must get a brain MRI. Even though the clinical symptoms are entirely referable to the spinal cord, we've got to get the MRI. Because remember, it's a critical aspect of that algorithm is to say, okay, you've got inflammation. It's in the spinal, it's in the central nervous system, but where? Is it just limited to the spinal cord or is it also present in the brain? And I think I'm going to stop there so I keep everybody on time. Are there any questions for me? Yes. Hit it. After seven and a half years of cancer, what is the next step? Is there any other steps that you I have actually, and I don't know how to explain it. It's interesting. I didn't know that it happened with you. So it was seven and a half years after the acute transverse myelitis. Right. And it doesn't make any sense. Um, but, but I've heard it several times. In fact, I, I know several people who are in this room right now who have shared that experience. And so I don't want to give away any names. But, uh, but you, can, you can talk together because that's a very interesting finding. IVIG is typically thought of as an anti-inflammatory agent. And so it's only going to be effective when the inflammation is present in the acute phase. It should not work seven and a half years later. And so I have reluctantly given it. And it actually, I, I'm convinced that it actually does. Sandy, have you had that experience? 